All right, so we're looking at cotangent of 2x. So let me get rid of this. This is the same as saying y equals cosine of 2x over the sine of 2x. And if you remember, I identified this as a point or a, an expression of concern. Any instance in which that value is equal to zero would indicate a vertical asymptote. All right, so I'm going to say, where is sine of 2x equal to zero? Now, when, <clears throat> pardon, the argument contained within the trig function is something other than just a simple x, we create a let statement. I'm going to let theta equal 2x. So instead, I'm looking for where sine of theta is equal to zero. All right. And so on the unit circle, sine is equal to zero whenever the y coordinate at any location is equal to zero. And that happens when theta is equal to zero or pi, or I could even say two pi, right? But I'll say zero or pi. Because if you remember, all we need is the distance between two vertical asymptotes, knowing that the pattern is going to repeat over and over again. Once we find the distance between two vertical asymptotes, we know the distance between any two vertical asymptotes. All right. Since theta is equal to 2x, I can say 2x is equal to 0, or 2x is equal to pi, which means x is equal to 0, x is equal to pi over 2. All right, then it's a matter of establishing the scale, all right, horizontally, uh, definitely more important than vertically. Horizontally, I just want to make sure I have enough room to get a few cycles of this function through. All right, so I'm going to let four, one, two, three, four values represent the value of pi, uh, four um, tick marks, I should say, four boxes. Two pi would be over here. Negative pi over here negative two pi over here all right pi over two same as half of pi so that tells me i have a vertical asymptote at well it's at pi over two but that's going to be at the location that's half the distance between the y-axis and pi all right we also have one at zero All right, so I'm going to propagate outwards with these two vertical asymptotes. Every two units, I'm going to have a vertical asymptote. And this one went a little off the rails. All right, and all the same stuff going on in the other direction. But I'll just do it two at a time. All right, so I just need one more. I'll just do the double and erase one of them. Right on down the line. And then oh, there's some people in the waiting room. All right. And so I just need to make my cotangent graph. All right. So remember, that's the, uh, the reverse of the tangent. Tangent starts low, goes high for a positive tangent function. Cotangent starts high, goes low. All right. But always goes through the vertical asymptote midpoints. And this one doesn't have any of the other, uh, you know, other trimmings like a uh, vertical shift or horizontal shift. Uh, the only thing that's different is that it has an A value. I'm sorry, B value that's other other than one, right? So if I cycle through, you know, get the get the first one 
to be okay. And then I just repeat that pattern over and over again. Then I'll have my cotangent function. Oh, I had zoom for some reason. And with graphs that are this complicated, I mean, just using common sense, I'll tell you that it's not gonna be an instance where I'm gonna be looking to take off points for the quality of the graph. When, when we do this on a, on a test, All right? So just as long as you have your asymptotes and the general shape of the graph correct, then, then you're gonna be good. Don't, don't worry. I mean, look at, you know, around this area here, see it goes a little off the rails and that's all right. All right. And then I'm just going to throw some arrows on. Just make sure you get those arrows on there. I'm not nitpicky about too many things, but labeling graphs and putting arrows on it, those are my uh, my big sticking points. I don't feel great when I take off credit when somebody forgets to put arrows, and I can't imagine the person who lost credit is going to feel too good about that. So just be careful. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to try to make a note in the review when I I'm still working on the review for the test. All right. Um, at this point, it's not going to be next week. Right. Just to just to kind of get that out there. Right. Uh, we still have enough material left in the unit that I don't want to rush things. So next week we'll learn new stuff. I'm anticipating the following Monday would be the test, All right? So I'll 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 make this all official as we go forward. But that would be All right. So we're at the twenty second. So that would be April third, right? April third is where I where I have in mind that we would uh, we would take the next test, All right? So just figured I'd mention that because it's kind of organic to the conversation. But like I said, I'll make a note of that um, on Brightspace and also make sure I get a review out to you. And in that review, I'll try to make make mention of things like uh, making sure to put arrows on your graphs when you create your graph. All right. So that was a, uh, call it a relatively basic graph. Then we get to number four, which has more of the, uh, the bells and whistles, All right? So that's got a horizontal, a vertical shift, and it's also got an amplitude other than one. Now we talked about this last time, when you have an amplitude that's not equal to one, it doesn't really do much in terms of the graph. It just means that it should be steeper. But when you're doing a graph by hand, it doesn't always come through, right? So I'm not looking to, to ding anybody for stuff like that. Just midline intercept, general shape of the graph. As long as you have your vertical asymptotes in place, you're good, All right? So again, looking at the important part of the, the equation here, I'm just kind of pull this off over here. That's cosine of X minus pi over two over sine of x minus pi over two. All right, so I'm asking myself, self, where is sine of x minus pi over two equal to, uh, to zero? And I didn't give myself enough room for an ex uh, exclamation point, um, question mark. We'll just move it over and tuck it in. All right, so it's a little complicated within the, the, the sine function. So I'm going to let theta equal x minus pi over two. So I'm asking myself, where is sine of theta equal to zero? That happens when theta is equal to zero or pi. 
just the same as what we did a couple minutes ago. Then I'm going to replace the theta with what I know it really is, x minus pi over 2. All right, so solving for x, I get x is equal to pi over 2. x is equal to, oops, sorry. It should be a pi. x is equal to, to uh, 3 pi over 2. All right, so those are my magic values to determine my vertical asymptotes. I'm going to scale this the same way I did the last graph. All right, going by four units to equal pi. Two pi. Negative pi. Negative two pi. Then on top of that, I'm going to have to account for other ingredients like the phase shift, right? So the A value here is two, the B value is one, C value is negative pi over two, and the D value is a negative one. All right, that D value is the vertical translation, VT. All right, tend to over abbreviate VA for vertical asymptote, VT for vertical translation. At, at the least, you get the idea that the V stands for vertical. All right, so I'm taking my midline and shifting it down one unit. So my new midline is going to be here. My vertical asymptotes are at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And if you compare that to what we had in the previous example, vertical asymptotes were at 0 and pi over 2. All right. So this one is showing a shift. All right. So pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. All right. So we get the shift from the statement of the new vertical asymptotes, which is which is a good thing, all right? So, pi over two, and actually comparing it to that one was probably not the best idea, because I'm thinking about if this one had a, a B value of two, it's really better to compare it to the, the parent function which has vertical asymptotes at zero and pi. If I take my vertical asymptote at zero and shift it over, it's really the same as saying, take the entire graph and shift it to the right, pi over two units. Oops, I don't even know what that was going to be. And it would look something like this. But we have other things going on, all right? So we're taking it not only shifting it to the right, we're also shifting it one unit down. So, and elongating, elongating it just ever so slightly. So, you know, it's not quite apples to apples, but it really is the kind of idea that we would have, of the, you know, just taking a parent function and just moving it around a little bit, left, right, up, down, All right? So three pi over two, So every four units, I'm going to have a vertical asymptote. I'll just freehand that. I did the copy paste on the other one because there were so many of them, but I'll just do it quickly by hand here. All right, so I have accounted for, and I'm I'm just going to make a little note here. This is this accounts. Oops, that's two C's. Accounts for the C value. 
that would be the phase shift. So if I find my vertical asymptotes, I know where the graph lives. In some cases, it'll be a shifted parent function. In other cases, it won't be shifted. It'll, uh, you know, it, it might just be elongated, right? But if it is shifted, it could be shifted left or right or up or down, right? In this case, it's being shifted pi over two units to the right and also shifted down one unit, right? But that's accounted for in stating our new vertical asymptotes, which is all this work here, right? So slightly different. Um, visually, it's massively different than what we were doing for sine and cosine, but conceptually, it's only slightly different, all right? I still need my midpoints, but these midpoints happen on the new midline. This is a positive cotangent function. So just like the previous one, start high and low. So something like that. The difference between a graph that has a B value of one and a B value that's bigger than one is really just the, uh, the amount of stretch of the graph. So you'll notice, and, and this is really, it's not anything that you would need to worry about, but you'll notice that I kind of made this sort of a smoother transition from the high side here to the low side here. Whereas in this graph, I gave it a little wiggle, all right? I gave it a little wiggle around the x-axis, kind of like going back to the concept of multiplicity, all right? So it it's shallower around the midline intercept when the x value is closer to one. It's steeper when it's greater than one. But I don't know how I would be able to assess that. Like, oh, you didn't have enough wiggle in your graph, minus one point. It's not going to be like that. So as long as you have the appropriate orientation, starts high, ends low, goes through the midline intercept, and you have your appropriate vertical asymptotes, and you have arrows on the end, which I'll do in a second, then you don't have to worry about losing credit. That being said, I just rattled off five things that you need to keep in keep in mind. So, you know, it's it's probably easier said than done, but what I'll do is I'll just kind of chuck it off over, you know, I'll put it right in the middle here and say, the things you need to be mindful of are vertical asymptotes, vertical translation, arrows, midline, midpoints. And I guess even before all of that would be the x-axis scale. All right, these are the important ingredients when you're creating a graph. All right, so keep those things in mind, write them down. When you're taking the test, reference that when you make a graph. And by the way, I don't think I can give any more any more hints that there's going to be a graph like this on the test. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. But when you're taking the test and you're referencing your notes, make sure you have this somewhere where you're like, okay, I'm not going to forget to look at this. You know, like maybe like a little... Uh, little index card with information, things to be mindful of when I'm creating a graph. All right. The next one's a simple negative tangent function. I'm actually gonna save that for next time because again, the whole spiraling thing, I wanna be able to come back to it, have somewhere to start. But what I wanna do now is talk about um, applications of trig graphs. So we're going to hop up a few pages. I actually stole my own thunder like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We've we've actually already covered this top this topic, but prior to the test, I'll make sure the, to to review it. All right. But for now, we're going to hop on over to page 21. And we're going to talk about trig function modeling. All right. So when we say modeling and math, 
the same word problems. Modeling. Modeling is the first word of, word of the day. Can't speak today for some reason. So modeling is the first word of the day. As in trig function modeling. Right. So this example here, when hyperventilating, a person breathes in and out very rapidly. A spirogram is a machine that draws a graph of the volume of air in a person's lungs as a function of time. During hyperventilation, the person's spirogram trace might uh, be represented by V equals this function, where V is the volume of air in liters in the lungs at time T minutes. So the first thing I want to do is sketch a graph of the function, one period of the function, and indicate the window used. Now, that, that's old school terminology. We don't really need that. So I'm going to just get rid of it. That's more for the uh, TI-84s. Not really relevant here. All right. Now, off on the side, yeah, this is a pretty funky looking uh, function but I'm going to put the, the standard form of a cosine wave because at the heart of this mess is a COS, a cosine. So I'm going to say, oops, it's not a marker. Y equals A cosine BX plus C plus D. All right, I'm going to match up what they gave me to that model. So See all the cosine business comes off at the end? That should be this part here. So I'm going to write this as negative. I'll put the y equals negative. Well, actually, it would be uh, v equals v for volume. Negative 0 0.05 cosine 200 pi t. And then this is a assumed, well, more than assumed, it doesn't have a negative sign on it. So it's a positive three. So plus three at the end. All right. So my A value is negative, negative 0.05. My B value is 200 pi. The C value is zero because there, there is no like loose value here after the X. Now, this uh, this function here, the V function, has an independent variable of T, but we're gonna treat it the same way that we would an X, all right? The D value is uh, three. All right, so very slight amplitude. Now, a normal cosine function, so cosine function starts high, goes low and comes back high. A negative cosine function starts low, goes high, and then comes back low. All right, so this is gonna start at the minimum. I do need to know the period. Period is equal to two pi over B. So in this case, two pi over 200 pi. So the period is one one hundredth of a unit. Now the unit that we're referring to, it's time T in minutes, right? So this is the horizontal units. All right, so it's saying, that one complete cosine wave is happening in one one hundredth of a minute. All right, so setting up my scale can be kind of funky, but also thinking about it contextually, you think about hyperventilating, you're breathing in and out very rapidly, all right? Very rapidly. So that's saying that you're gonna, you're actually gonna get one inhale, exhale every one hundredth of a minute. All right, so quick computation. One one hundredth of a minute, if I wanna know how many seconds that is, 60 over 100. 
So roughly every six tenths of a second, I'm going to do a complete inhale, exhale, right? But the amplitude is very small. It's saying that I'm breathing very fast, but the trade-off for that is I'm not getting much in terms of volume, right? I'm getting a smidge in and out, right? So it's more like instead of a, it's more like a, right? So I don't want to do that too much. Otherwise I'll start hyperventilating. Uh, but it's kind of like how you can give yourself the hiccups. I don't want to go down that road. That, um, well, the hyperventilating part would be bad, but even the hiccups, I've, I haven't had those in quite some time and I'm, I'm not eager to have them again. All right. And also I, I firmly believe that hiccups are contagious. All right. And part of it is, is sort of a mental thing, but I've been around enough instances. I haven't done a study on this yet, but I've been around enough instances. It's kind of like a yawn where a person will, one person will yawn, somebody else will get it in their head and then they'll yawn too. I feel like that to a lesser extent also happens with the hiccups. That'd be an interesting study. Right? Also probably for a different course, like a stack course. Right? So what I want to do is I want to create an increment that allows me to go out one one hundredth of a second, right? I need to make this tangible, so visible and tangible, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish the horizontal axis in the middle. I just, I created a frame around this. I have no idea why. Uh, probably had something to do with the TI. And I'm, I'm going to put the vertical axis over here. Now, the horizontal axis is in terms of time. The vertical axis is in terms of volume. So instead of X, Y, B, and T. I feel like, and, and I would imagine most people would agree, that in contextual situations, it's probably more important to label your axes. If it's just an ordinary function, X, Y, and you, know, you kind of take it for granted. But I want to keep an eye on what this stuff represents as I go. Right. So I want to have some even increments. Now, again, it's not in terms of pi. The period is one one hundredth of a unit. But I do need to break up whatever distance I have. I have to break that up into quarters. Uh, in terms of a phase shift, there is none. So no phase shift, PS for phase shift. So I don't have to worry about shifting left and right and going off the grid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out every four units, make a mark. Uh, actually, I'm going to go out every eight units. And I'm probably going to regret that, but we'll see. Ah, just one short. All right, every seven units it is, or six units I'll go. One, two, three, four, five, six. I just wanna give myself a little room to make the graph. All right, I'm not gonna use up the whole horizontal axis, but at least I'll use up a good chunk of it. All right, now this has a vertical shift of three units. So my new midline is gonna be here. I'm gonna make it dashed, but I'm gonna do it by erasing segments. All right, so that's my new midline. And if you want, you could actually make some fresh new tick marks on that. All right, just to give yourself a little frame of reference. Now, this is one one hundredth of a second. Half of one one hundredth. I mean, you can do it in a calculator, but it's going to be one one hundredth times one half, which would be one two hundredths. Half of a half is a quarter, so one four hundredths. Quarter, half, three quarters, three four hundredths, and then one one hundredth. All right, 
So again, you could just do it by taking, and I mentioned this last time, you take whatever the period is, multiply it by zero. That gives you your starting point. Multiply it by a half, a quarter, sorry. I did it in decimal form, so it gave me an answer in decimal form. Hang on once. Oh, there it is. One four hundredth. Then do it again. One one hundredth times a half. One one hundredth times three quarters. Oops. And then times one will be just one one hundredth, right? <clears throat> Now, in terms of the increments, that's a little trickier, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I just use the word increment without talking about context. The vertical increments, right? So I went by one unit to represent the vertical axis. There's one, two, this got me up to three, right? But the amplitude is 0 0.05. So that's gonna be very minuscule. So we're starting, we're looking at a graph like this, but we're starting only one twentieth. Uh, yeah, it's one twentieth below the midline, right? So this is gonna be an extraordinarily shallow graph. So I'm gonna just kind of ballpark that. I'll put it right there, right? This value here, I'll make a thinner marker. That's gonna be, 0.05 less than three, so 2.95. I'll put the tick mark over here. 2.95. And then on the other side, we'll go as high as 3.05. So we start off at the minimum, hit the midline at the quarterway point. The, the maximum, the, the it's a roll reversal kind of situation at the halfway point, the midline at the three quarter way point, and then back to the minimum at the end point. So we're looking at something like this. All right. So it's a very shallow cosine graph. And, you know, that could happen because the amplitude, I mean, Technically, the amplitude could be really anything greater than zero. Well, actually, anything that's non-zero, because if it's negative, you could you could have it, you know, just it's still a distance, but the, the reflection over the x-axis would occur, All right? So now we have the graph. Determine the time it takes for the volume of air in a person's lungs to be at a maximum. Well, we have the graph. So here's where it's at a maximum. Here and here, it would be at a minimum. They didn't ask that, but I'm just gonna make a note. All right, now, the points where it's on the x-axis would be instances where there's no volume in the lungs, right? So there's no volume of air contained within the lungs, which, which must mean that there's a full exhale. It's that little transition between an exhale and an inhale, right? So we're saying – let me just get this here. And really, it's, I mean, it's, I, I say none, but that's not true because we did do a vertical shift. So there's always some amount of air. This is the baseline, really. Amount of volume of air. So that's the baseline volume. We're either going to go less than that or greater than that. And that happens in two places. Because, you know, I, I realize I misspoke because it's not, it's not a matter of just saying there's no air in the lungs. 
the the air the volume created by air in the lungs is based off of whatever the baseline amount of air that would typically be in deflated lungs All right so i'm not talking about like if this were on the x axis i would say we we're talking about like collapsed lungs that's a different story like when you exhale there's still volume contained within your lungs all right it doesn't just flatten out like a pancake all right it you know it flattens out but doesn't like doesn't become like voidless you know like there, there's still there's still some void within the lungs all right so but the the idea of a maximum is pretty clear right that's going to happen every or at, sorry, at one over 200 minutes, all right? Now, the, the last part here is mark the following on the graph above, the interval when the person is breathing in. So that would be an instance where volume is increasing and the in, in, interval where the person is breathing out. So I'm just gonna draw a quick sketch of what we did because that one up there is getting pretty busy. So we started low, went high, and then came back low. Poor quality, do that again. All right, so this is again, min, min, max. All right, so over this interval, the person is breathing in. And over this interval, the person is breathing out. All right, the idea of a maximum versus a minimum and what happens over those intervals, you know, that, that's it's more of a calculus concept. And we'll, uh, you know, do more and more of that as we go forward. But, you know, it's not it's not a calculus course, so we don't have to figure out precisely certain things. It's just a matter of having general knowledge. All right, but that that's really only, the only kind of um, I'll call it word problem or modeling situation. It's really the idea that something's happening over time, over an interval. You map it out, determine some maximums, some minimums, which are pretty easy to pick off of trig graphs. And then, uh, you know, where it's increasing and decreasing. Increasing, very simple, is just going uphill. Decreasing, going downhill. All right, so the next example involves uh, temperature. All right, so outside temperature over the course of a day can be modeled as a sinusoidal function. Suppose you know the temperature is 68 degrees at midnight, all right, so it's probably summer. And the high temperature during the day is 80, 80 degrees, all right, so maybe early summer. All right, the high and low temperatures during the day. Actually, I was gonna say this is kind of unrealistic, but I guess it could. I guess it could be the case because midnight is not necessarily the the point of the day with the lowest temperature. So I guess it could work. Assuming t is the number of hours since midnight, find the function or find a function for the temperature d in terms of t. So we're gonna write the function here, and then create the graph, and then determine the maximum value. All right. So in terms of the period, well, if midnight is the start of our moment of interest, then that would be the start of the period. But really, we want to know when it's going from the maximum. If it's a, a sine function, it's going to be at some midline value. It's going to go to the maximum, back down to the minimum, and then back to the midline. All right. So it should complete one full cycle over the course of 24 hours, all right? So one full cycle over 24 hours. 
All right. That's the definition of period. So the period is 24. Now I got to be able to write a function out of this. All right. So I'm going to call it, well, I'll call it y equals a sine bx plus c plus d. All right. So the period is going to help me figure out the b value. The A value is, it's the amplitude, or it helps us figure out the amplitude, the, the distance from the midline to the maximum, distance from the midline to the minimum, all right? So I know the minimum is 56 degrees. The maximum is 80 degrees. The midline should be the average of those two. All right, so if you add these two numbers together, 56, it was 56 and 80, right? 56 plus 80 divided by two, oops. One thirty-six. Geez, that's going to be sixty-eight. Now they actually gave us that, but there's no guarantee that they would. So it's worth at least talking about how you'd figure it out. All right. So the midline would be at the average between those two values, and so I could figure out the a value if I know the midline. And and really, when it comes to creating graphs. Uh, as long as you know the important pieces of information, you could develop a scale reasonable to handle that. I know that the difference between the maximum and the midline is 12 degrees, and the difference between the midline and the minimum is also 12 degrees. All right. So if I want to establish my midline to be right in the middle of the graph, I can do that. All right. This is y equals 68 degrees. My vertical axis just needs to be scaled so that it could handle a difference of 12 units in either direction, All right? So the amplitude you could get by finding max minus midline or midline minus minimum. Either way, it's going to be equal to 12 degrees, All right? So these are temperature degrees, not like trig angular measurements, All right? So I could go by twos on the vertical axis. I mean, it's not unreasonable when creating this graph. But I could also go by something more reasonable like fours or even threes. I'll go by threes. So this will get me to 80. This will get me to the, uh, the 56. All right. So somewhere down here is where y equals zero is. All right. So as y equals zero, you have a little break. And then we, we're kind of focusing in on this area. All right. So when you create a graph, it doesn't have to show the x-axis um, or the y-axis, depending on where the where the data exists. All right, as long as the scale is a relative scale, you're good. All right, so I know my amplitude. Now, I do have like in my mind this question of, all right, is this a sine function that's going to start at the midline, go up, and then come down, and then go back up again, or is it one that's going to go down, up, and back down again later on. All right. So we would want to think about what is, I would say, logical. At midnight, I don't expect it to get warmer. Like in the hours, I mean, just even think about, forget about summer, think about the winter. You know, like you go to sleep and we just had a snowstorm. Uh, last week, I mean, some areas got it worse than others. I mean, I, we barely got anything around here, but 
like overnight, you have your overnight lows, right? So you had water on the road late at night, 10, 11 p.m. Then you get to midnight and then it starts getting colder and colder and colder. Then it ices up for the morning commute, at which point it starts increasing. So we're looking at something. If we're starting at midnight, it's going to decrease, right? So it's going to decrease, then increase and then decrease again, all right? So this is gonna be a negative sign graph. I'll use a highlighter, but that's based off of the context of it. The good thing about something like this is all you have to do is look at your, uh, your weather app on your phone and you'll see, I'll do that right now. Let's see, it's 52 degrees right now, White Plains. All right, it will, drop at eight o'clock to 50 degrees, 48 from nine to 10 o'clock, 47 up until midnight. Then it goes 46, 45, 44. Uh, and then around somewhere in the four to 5 a.m. hour, it's gonna start increasing again. Sunrise at 6.53 a.m., then 46. By 10 a.m. it's 49. And then it rains out in the afternoon. Irrelevant to the problem, but figured if anybody wanted a little forecast action, uh, you would get that. But bottom line is temperature is going to decrease after midnight. And that's what this vertical line represents. This is midnight. All right. So how do we know we're starting at midnight? It says it right here. Sketch a graph of one period of, oh, sorry, wrong thing. Assuming T is the number of hours since midnight, right? So that's telling us to start at midnight and then go 24 hours after that, midnight to midnight. So let me see how, how many tick marks I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So I can get 24 hours in here. So in quarter unit increments, I'm going to say every six hours. So this is 6 a.m. Well, p.m. 6 p.m. 12 a.m. And again, we're starting at midnight, which is 12 a.m. Now, in terms of the equation, we have everything we need. We have the amplitude, the period. Now, the vertical shift, well, normally the midline is on the x-axis. The midline here is at 68 degrees, All right? So that's a vertical translation, a VT. So my A value is 12. My B value, well, we haven't figured out the B value yet. We'll do that in a second but I do know the D value now is 68 degrees, right? Now for the B value, we know the period, right? So the period is 24, 24 hours. You know, I can go out and I mean, this is really, if we're counting in, in normal, normal, what do we call it, military time, this would really be six, 12, 18 and 24. Right, but I just put it in terms of clock time, or at least ordinary clock time, non military. Right, but the period is equal to two pi over b. This is an instance where we know the period, we just don't know the b value. Right, so the period is 24, two pi over b, two pi over b. Nice attribute of a proportion. That 24 could be thought of as 24 over one. You could swap diagonal values in a proportion. So this would make B over one equal to two pi over 24, which makes B equal to pi over 12. So my function, they said to do a D in terms of T. So D, oh, that's a little, I don't like that. Because we use D for vertical translation. I'm going to say 
I'll, I'll just say F. I'm going to get rid of this and call it F. If anybody's wondering, it's because F for Fahrenheit, but it really doesn't matter, right? So F of T is equal to my amplitude, which is 12, but it has to be negative because we're decreasing first, not increasing. Sine the B value pi over 12, X, sorry, T, they said to use T, There is no phase shift, but there is a vertical translation. And a good question of, okay, why is there no phase shift? They didn't give us an indication of a phase shift, right? A good example of that, which I'm not going to ask you to do on a test, but just so you know, is let's say this is information about Monday, right? Just some ordinary Monday. And then they tell you that on Tuesday, everything happens a half an hour after it happened on Monday, right? So the high temperature is half an hour later, the low temperature is half an hour later, and so on. Then you could pull that, um, you know, you can create that graph by using a shift. But this, in this case, it's not really accounted for, right? So I'm going to start off at my midline. I'm going to hit the, mid, uh, the minimum at the quarter way point, then the midline again at the halfway point. I'm going to hit the maximum at the three quarter way point, and then back to the minimum at the end point. Now, temperatures throughout the day don't always play out this way. It just so happened that my my midline temperature was at midnight. That's not that's not really typical. Just like the low temperature probably isn't going to happen at six a.m. and the high temperature isn't pro probably not going to happen at six p.m. Usually, like low temperature at four a.m. and I mean it could be symmetrical like this, but you know low temperature at four a.m. and then high temperature at like four p.m. with the midline temperature being at ten p.m. You know, but you know for this. Uh, fictitious problem we you know we, we we can at least get get a sense of the um relationship 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 is the second word of the day relationship like the relationship between time and temperature throughout the day relationship all right so this is my max. This is my min. So when is the temperature going to be at its maximum value? That's going to be 6 p.m. When will it be at its lowest value? 6 a.m. And at what times will the temperature be exactly 68 degrees? That happens anywhere that we hit the midline here, here, and here. Right. So that would be 12 a.m., 12 p.m., there's three points. One of them is the 12 a.m. that started this whole thing, and the other will be the 12 a.m. of the next day, so we'll throw that in there, too. 12 a.m. All right. So, again, I mean, the, the difference between this question and the previous one is the previous one gave you the equation. But here it gave you everything necessary to create an equation, right? So it's, I'd say probably a little trickier, but you have all the tools necessary to be able to handle something like this. All right. So at least for now, that's it for trig graphs. We're actually going to go on to trigonometric identities now. So these are relationships or um, you can call them truths. Identities are statements, expressions that are always true, all right? So if I say one plus zero is equal to one, all right? Zero 
didn't change the value of one. So that's a true sentence. One plus zero is equal to one. But I could also say, for example, to generalize it, a plus zero is equal to A. That creates a rule that talks about the additive identity. So one, one is just an example of a property at work. If I were to say one plus zero is equal to one, that's just an example of a property. But if I create a general rule for a property that's always known to be true, that's known as an identity, right? And one of the basic identities for trigonometry, and I guess it's trig, so nothing really seems basic, is what we call a Pythagorean identity. All right, sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. I'm going to show you what that what that really means on the next page. So this trig tri trigonometry, sorry, I can't, can't talk. I was going to say trigonometric, but I got caught in the middle. Uh, this trigonometry identities page is really, really useful for all the stuff that follows after this. So have this handy, you know, have uh, some variation of this handy and, uh, and you'll find your life is a lot easier, at least in the short term. When you get to calculus, you're going to want to know all this stuff, right? So get to a point where you have it all memorized, right? In order to do that, you, you kind of chunk it up, you know, memorize a little bit, you know, maybe maybe the first chunk here over the next month and then worry about the next one and so on. I don't know when you plan on taking calculus. If you're doing it over, doing it over the summer, I would say memorize a chunk a week, right? So between now and the start of the summer session, if assuming you're taking it in the first summer session, take a chunk, commit it to memory over the next week, then the next chunk over the next week, next chunk over the next week. But if you're doing it in the fall, you can you can go by months, right? But take some time and memorize this and your life will be much, much simpler when you get to calculus, all right? And anybody who has any experience with calculus knows that I am speaking the truth, all right? So I wanted to walk you through on page 24 where that Pythagorean identity came from, all right? So this is just like a basic shell of the unit circle, all right? So if I have a circle, and so it's actually not the unit circle, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it applies to the unit circle. So this is a circle with center at zero, zero, and radius, radius, equal to some value r, all right? And in the next unit, we're gonna explore conic sections, one of, one of which is a circle. But for now, just take it on faith that the equation is x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. All right, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. If r is equal to one, then you have a unit circle. And the equation for that would be x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Well, one squared, but that ends up being one. So if I draw just the unit circle, rid of some fluff here oh that was a little little much i'm gonna lock it in there it is in the unit circle the radius is always equal to one you can get to this point from this point so from the origin to a point on the circumference of the circle by going right well, for this point anyway right some number of units and up some number of units. You could also go left and down, you can go left and up, right and down. Bottom line is you're going to have a horizontal movement followed by a vertical movement. 
that horizontal movement is X. That vertical movement is Y, right? Since this is a right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem is in full effect. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. So that becomes X squared plus Y squared is equal to one squared. So this is actually how the equation of a circle is derived, right? Some horizontal movement to get to the circumference and followed by some vertical movement. So how does this try, uh, tie in together with trig? Well, we learned when we talked about the unit circle that any point on the circumference x, y can also be identified as cosine theta comma sine theta. All right, so what I'm actually doing here is I'm letting, so let, x equal cosine theta and y equal sine theta. If I do a direct substitution, replace x with cosine theta and y with sine theta, I get cosine of theta squared plus sine of theta, also squared, equals one. Now we tend to write, it, it's, you're not gonna like this, but technology accepts powers of a trig function one way, but we write it a different way. So when you put it, when you put cosine squared in the calculator, you're probably going to want to write it the way I just wrote it here. But on paper, we write it as the cosine function squared plus the sine function squared. And so that's actually where this cosine squared plus sine squared equals one comes into play, all right? Because addition is commutative, just making sure I'm not stealing my own thunder, I could, of course I have it. I could also write sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to one. Now we have corollaries to this identity. This is the Pythagorean identity. And hopefully the name of it sort of makes sense. Where do we start? We started with the Pythagorean theorem. All right, so this is the Pythagorean identity. Now there's a corollary to that and just a kind of a, an extension on it. If I, I'm gonna start off with my cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals one. If I solve, for cosine squared theta. I would do that by subtracting sine squared theta from both sides. So that tells me that cosine squared theta is equal to one minus sine squared theta. I could also solve the original equation, this Pythagorean identity. I could solve it for sine of theta Or sorry, sorry, sine squared theta, I would do that by subtracting the cosine from both sides. So essentially this getting moved over here with a minus sign in between, all right? So that's gonna be, let me just clean this up. Sine squared theta is equal to one minus cosine squared theta. All right, so by knowing the one fact, all right, and that fact is cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. I'm gonna call this most important.
right? That's most important. By knowing that, I was able to figure out two other formulas. Another thing I can do, would just going back to my cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one, I could divide both sides. So divide by sine squared theta. All right. I could divide both sides by sine squared theta, which means I'm dividing every term by sine squared theta. All right. So that's going to give me, I'm just kind of put this as an underline here. Just kind of cleaning it up a little bit. I would have cosine squared theta over sine squared theta plus sine squared theta over sine squared theta is equal to one over sine squared theta. All right, so I divided every term in this function, this one, this one, and this one, I divided it by sine squared theta. And that gave me this, this, and this in no particular order. Each of which simplifies because cosine over sine is the same as cotangent. So cosine squared over sine squared would be cotangent squared. Sine over sine is equal to one. Anything over itself is equal to one. So sine squared over sine squared should be equal to one. One over sine is cosecant. So one over sine squared should be cosecant squared. And there's actually one more. So I'm going to create a little room here. but I'll still zoom in. All right, so one final thing that we could have done, taking this and dividing it by cosine squared. So divide by cosine squared theta. So I'd get cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta over cosine squared theta equals one over cosine squared theta. All right, so I'm taking every one of the terms in my original Pythagorean identity and dividing by cosine squared. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is equal to one, cancels out. Sine over cosine is the same as tangent. So sine squared over cosine squared would be tangent squared. One over cosine squared. Oh, sorry, one over cosine would be secant. So one over cosine squared would be secant squared. All right, so born from this one rule here, we have one, two, three, four, five new rules, All right? So this is my way of saying that if you know that first rule, you could pretty much figure out every other rule, All right? This goes back to what I was talking about probably last time, because Cosine is the complement of sine. So if you know everything there is about sine, you could figure out everything about cosine. Tangent is sine divided by cosine. So if you know everything about sine, and by extension, everything about cosine, then you know everything about tangent. Every other function is a reciprocal of sine, cosine, and tangent. So knowing about sine teaches you everything you know, need to know about everything else. Same idea here. 
knowing cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one allows you to figure out everything else. So what we just did was we discovered all of these rules, all right? These we already knew. So check these off, we're good. You should know these by now. These new rules, we just invented them. But we learned that you don't have to memorize them as long as you know the first one, all right? The other rules, they take a little doing. Different story for a different day, I guess. But at least we're kind of proficient in the first chunk now. Now, what you need to do is start working towards committing that to memory. Right? You want to get to a point where you don't have to do all of, let me get my marker back on here. You don't want to have to do all of this stuff to come up with the rules. At some point, you want it to be instant recall. Like, for example, the square root of eight. Right, just think about that. Square root of eight is two radical two. Why? Because you can make a little tree diagram, break it up into radical four and radical two and simplify. Or, well, it's two radical two because the last 17 times that I did that problem, it was two radical two. At some point, it starts becoming part of your, your vernacular for mathematics, right? So going forward, like when I say tangent, you don't want to be thinking, oh, well, what's that rule again? Cosine over sine or is it sine over cosine? I can never remember. That's not a good place, right? You want to get to a point where you're you're getting this stuff so down pat that when somebody says tangent is sine over cosine, you're like, of course it is. Why? Why not? Why wouldn't it be? It's always that, right? So it's kind of experiential learning as opposed to uh, computational skills, right? So yeah, because you could you could find in a calculator. I mean, if if I wanted to verify the tangent, so tangent of let's say pi, well, that's a bad example. Uh, I'll say pi over four. That's that, well, I suspect tangent is sine over cosine, so I could say sine of pi over four divided by cosine of pi over four. Oh, look, it gave the same number, but I had to take like 45 seconds to figure it out. You want to be at tangent is equal to sine over cosine. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. Cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. Secant is one over cosine. Cosecant is one over sine. Cotangent is cosine over sine or one over tangent. Like you want to be able to rattle it off right off your brain and then incorporate the unit circle so that you could say things like the sine of 45 degrees is radical two over two. The cosine of 315 degrees is also radical two over two. The tangent of 135 degrees is equal to negative one. You know, like you want to have instant recall on that stuff if you want to be highly successful in the next courses that come after this. But like I said previously, this is the last math class you're taking, then you're just learning all this stuff for fun. But if you're if you plan on going down the calculus road, you're going to want to get this trig stuff down. Pat, whoever Pat is, all right? So that's where I'm going to leave it tonight because you need some time to digest this. You, you want to take some time to start committing it to memory. So that's really all I'm going to ask you to do between now and next class. So Monday, Tuesday, next week, new material. I'll have, I promise I will have the practice test up before class on Monday. So I hope to have it up by the end of this week. So you can start looking at that and seeing what's expected of you. But, um, but yeah, we're going to build off of this material. What we just talked about tonight, we're going to build off of that on Monday. So take some time and, 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 and get to know these formulas, all right, these identities. All right, so with that, I am going to stop the recording.